Hello, welcome to this video lecture on The Red-Headed League, a short story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This short story is included in Module 4 of the core paper reading fiction prescribed for the third semester BA English students of the University of Kerala. Arthur Ignatius Conan Doyle was born on 22nd May 1859 in Scotland. When Doyle was 20 years old and in his third year of medical studies, he was offered the post of a ship's surgeon on the Hope. It was a whaling boat that left for the Arctic Circle. The adventures on this ship inspired Conan Doyle to write his first story about the sea, a frightening tale called Captain of the Pole Star. As a young man, Doyle divided his time between trying to be a good doctor and struggling to become a recognized and popular author. In March 1886, he started writing the novel which made him world famous. This novel, published as A Study in Scarlet in 1887, introduced the immortal characters, the detective Sherlock Holmes and his companion Dr. Watson. Another novel published in England and US in February 1890 titled The Sign of Four was instrumental in establishing Holmes and the author once and for all in the archives of literature. The series of short stories featuring the fictional detective Sherlock Holmes were first published in the Strand magazine. He has also written two other Sherlock Holmes novels, The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1902 and His Last Bow in 1914. Other Conan Doyle's short stories featuring Sherlock Holmes are mostly considered to be the landmarks in the genre of crime fiction. Now, this short story, The Red-Headed League, was first published in the Strand magazine in August 1891. Most of the stories are narrated by Dr. Watson. The story of The Red-Headed League begins with Dr. Watson visiting his friend Sherlock Holmes on a Saturday in autumn. There, he found the detective talking to an elderly gentleman named Jabez Wilson. Wilson was a stout, florid faced with small, fat and circled eyes and fiery red hair. Holmes also invited Watson to listen to Wilson's unusual story. Jabez Wilson was a small uh, pawnbroker. He had a small business at a place called Coburg Square near the city of London. And he had been disturbed by a recent mysterious incident and had come uh, to ask for Holmes' help, help in solving this issue. Mr. Wilson pulled out a dirty and wrinkled newspaper from the inside pocket of his coat and glanced down the advertisement column. While he was doing this, he was inspected very carefully by Holmes and Watson. And Holmes uh, deduced a few things about Mr. Wilson. He made a few assumptions and he started uh, telling Mr. Wilson that, you know, this is what you are, this is who you are and so on. And this shocked the client. So Holmes explained to him how he came to this conclusion, so how he came to these assumptions. Uh, that is only by careful observation. For example, Mr. Wilson had a fish tattoo above his right wrist and a Chinese coin hanging from his watch chain. So this in, this indicated or this uh, from this uh, from these two things, Holmes uh, concluded that Mr. Jabez Wilson has been to China. So he starts explaining one by one how he okay, how he understood a lot of things about Mr. Wilson. And then suddenly Mr. Wilson appears very disappointed. He slightly uh, is disappointed and he um, casually remarks that uh, he thought Holmes had been very clever and not because of these observations and so on. So Holmes then exclaims, Omne ignotum pro magnifico, which means 
everything unknown appears magnificent and Holmes admits to Dr. Watson that it was a mistake trying to explain and that his reputation might also suffer. Uh, so the man uh, um, starts talking, Mr. Jabez Wilson, and he shows, uh, you know, he had pulled out an, a newspaper from his pocket, from his coat pocket, and he showed Holmes and Watson an extraordinary announcement. It was an advertisement that had appeared in the Morning Chronicle, that's the name of a newspaper, on April 27, 1890. And this was the announcement. Uh, on account of the bequest of the late Ezekiah Hopkins of Lebanon, Pennsylvania, USA, there is another vacancy open which entitles a member of the league to a salary of four pounds a week for purely nominal services. All red-headed men who are sound in body and mind and above the age of 21 years are eligible. Apply in person on Monday at 11 o'clock to Duncan Ross at the offices of the league, Seven Popes Court, Fleet Street, London. So this is the advertisement. It, it mentions that uh, a peculiar uh, group known as the Red-Headed League, uh, which consisted only of uh, men with red hair, and that was uh, founded by uh, the late uh, Ezekiah Hopkins, of an American, and it seems a vacancy was open and uh, the, the candidate would get uh, four pounds a week and that too for very nominal services. Now, um, Jabez Wilson mentions that it was his assistant, uh, Vincent Spaulding, who had drawn his attention to this particular ad advertisement in the newspaper about this job vacancy and about the red-headed league and so on. Now, Wilson was interested because... His business, the pawnbroker shop, it was not very successful and he and he wished for an extra income. He wanted the extra income. So, um, uh, the, the assistant, Vincent Spaulding, ex explained to uh, Jabez Wilson, to his employer, that uh, this American millionaire, Ezekiah Hopkins, he was also red-headed and he had some kind of a, a sympathy towards all red-headed men. So, when he died, he left his enormous fortune to provide easy employment only to men with red hair. So the league employed men with red hair and Spalding also told Wilson that the league wanted Londoners because the American, the millionaire Ezekiah Hopkins had actually begun his business from London. So he persuaded Wilson to apply for the job and he himself took him personally to the place mentioned in the advertisement and Wilson was interviewed by the person by a person named Mr. Duncan Ross and uh, Mr. Ross explains to Wilson that uh, these are his duties. Uh, it is a very easy job. His only job was to copy the Encyclopedia Britannica every day from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and he should not leave the office during that time. From 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. he can't leave the office and he will be paid four pounds a week for this uh, for this job. The office will provide a table and chair, but Mr. Wilson had to bring his own ink, pens and blotting paper. Now, since the pawnbroker's business was mostly done during the evenings, Mr. Jabez Wilson says he was very happy to get the job and so he started, um, he joined the job and he started going. Now, uh, Mr. Wilson also talks about his assistant, Vincent Spaulding. Uh, he, uh, this man named Spaulding was a, uh, uh, selected from a group of men, uh, he had also uh, been called for an interview and why? And he mentions the reason why he selected this particular person, Vincent Spaulding, it was because he was willing to work for half the wages. And uh, the only fault that Mr. Wilson noticed was that Spaulding had an extreme passion for photography. He used to go down to the cellar of the shop the pawnbroker's shop had a cellar, so every time he, this man would run off to the cellar uh, saying that he had to develop his pictures in the dark cellar. Now, meanwhile, uh, Mr. Wilson worked regularly in the uh, league's office, the red-headed league's office for eight weeks. On October 9th, uh, 1890, when Mr. Jabez Wilson arrived at the office, he found it closed. There was a notice on the door that the league had been dissolved. And he was extremely shocked and disturbed by this curt and blunt announcement 
that he doubted suddenly he had this doubt that somebody was playing a joke on him now during those 8 weeks he had uh, promptly received his pay that was 4 pounds and all he had to do was to sit tight in the office and uh, copy the encyclopedia britannica from 10 am to 2 pm so uh, immediately he inquired uh, about this mr duncan ross the person who had interviewed him and appointed him and uh, the landlord of the of the uh, the place the office was re- uh, had was in a place and uh, uh, it was on rent so he asked the landlord and uh, uh, he understands that uh, the name of the person who had, in- who had interviewed him was not th- not actually mr duncan ross that it was a uh, uh, william morris and that he had been a lawyer who had rented the office on a temporary basis and the landlord also gave mr wilson an- another address to find this play this man called william morris also known as duncan ross but when mr wilson went there he understood that that was a fake address so that was why he decided to approach uh, mr holmes uh, so now mr holmes and dr watson they look at this advertisement and they uh, console mr wilson that uh, he holmes consoles mr wilson he says he is very much interested in the case and that he will certainly take up the case now mr holmes uh, as uh, wilson to give him a short description of his assistant vincent spalding so this is how wilson describes him so vincent spalding uh, was a man small stout built very quick in his ways no hair on his face with a white splash of acid on his forehead now holmes is excited when he hears this description he asks wilson whether spalding's ears are pierced Wilson affirms this and Holmes promises to look into the case and he tells Mr. Wa- Dr. Watson that this is a remarkable case. Now uh, after uh, Mr. Wilson departs Holmes immediately takes Mr. Watson a uh, Dr. Watson to visit the place Saxe Coburg Square where the pawnbroker's shop is located. There he does some mysterious things. He taps on the pavement on the street with a stick vigorously two or three times. Then he knocks on the door of the pawn shop and he asks for the clerk, uh, the the clerk named Vincent Spalding. So he gives him directions to go to the Strand. Holmes also uh, tells Mr. Uh, Doctor Watson that Spalding. is the fourth smartest man in london now dr watson doesn't understand anything of this he just uh, observes what sherlock holmes does and uh, the only thing that holmes reveals is that a considerable crime is in contemplation so uh, he instructs uh, dr watson to meet him later that evening at 10 pm and also to bring his army revolver so dr watson understands that uh, it is a serious business because he had been instructed to take his gun his revolver later when uh, watson meets homes at night at 10 pm he uh, sees that there are two people with him one is mr peter jones the official police agent of scotland yard and the the other person is mr merryweather a bank director so he understands that holmes has informed uh, mr jones of scotland yard and mr merryweather and he was talking to them about the possibility of a crime now the bank director mr merryweather was not entirely convinced but mr jones who had previous experience of working with holmes assures mr merryweather that uh, if holmes has a suspicion then it might be true then what holmes tells them is that he has uh, understood that john clay is vincent spalding so the assistant who works in jabez wilson's shop vincent spalding is actually a notorious and brilliant criminal named john clay now this a uh, man clay was a young person but he was a murderer a thief a forger and a master of his profession He also belonged to a very aristocratic family. Clay's grandfather had been a royal duke, and he had been educated at Eton and Oxford. Now, uh, the men then go leave. Uh, that is Holmes, uh, Mary Brewer, uh, Mr. Jones of Scotland Yard, and Doctor Watson. They go to the Coburg branch of the City and Suburban Bank. Mr. Mary Brewer reveals to them that the cellar. contains crates containing about 
thirty thousand gold coins borrowed from the bank of France. So they go down the steps into the cellar of the bank, and they wait silently in the dark. And Holmes tells everyone to be very careful, to be alert, and they wait for almost one hour and fifteen minutes. After some t- after this one hour and fifteen minutes, the men see a glint of light on the floor. They hear the sound of a paving stone being removed, and a clean-cut boyish face peeps out of the square hole. Now this young man comes out of the hole, and he helps his companion, who is red-headed, to come out of the hole. And Holmes immediately, without wasting time, jumps out and seizes the intruder by the collar. Meanwhile, his companion jumps back to into the hole and runs off before Mr. Jones could catch him. So the criminal John Clay understands that he has been caught by the police, and he has recognized Sherlock Holmes. So Clay compliments Holmes for his brilliant plan, and says, "Your re- and uh, Holmes also returns the compliment to John Clay for his brilliant uh, conspiracy to steal those gold coins from the bank's cellar, from the bank's vault." And this is what Holmes says. Your red-headed idea was very new and effective. Now, uh, the criminal, as I mentioned earlier, belonged to uh, an aristocratic family, so he was very um, rude to the police. And when Mr. Jones tries to handcuff him, uh, this person, John Clay, tells him, "You may not be aware that I have royal blood in my veins. Have the goodness also, when you address me, always to say, sir." And please, so we find here that uh, the author is introducing a kind of you know a, a kind of comic relief in the short story. The person, though he is a criminal, he is very conscious of his aristocratic lineage. So, uh, Mr. Jones gives a very fitting response to this. He uh, tells the criminal, "Well, would you please, sir, uh, march upstairs where we can get a cab to carry your highness to the police station?" So. Uh, The story soon ends. Holmes um, explains to the puzzled Watson about the robbery attempt. How he understood that a robbery will be a robbery was being planned, and uh, it was certain that uh, he, you know, Holmes understood immediately that somebody wanted uh, the pawnbroker, Mr. Jabez Wilson, away from the shop during that particular period of time, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that is why they came up with this uh, kind of a, a strange and funny idea about a red-headed league that required only uh, men with red hair to uh, work in an office for uh, for a few hours without budging from the office, and suddenly the office was closed down. So all with uh, he. Kind of connected all these links, and uh, again, Vincent Spaulding, or uh, also known as John Clay, the notorious criminal, he had offered uh, to work as Mr. Wilson's assistant for half the wages. And Wilson himself admits that he had a strange nature, a strange character. He was always running down to the cellar of the pawnbroker shop. So, uh, she, um, Holmes, uh, Sherlock Holmes, immediately understood that uh, you know they were actually digging a kind of a, a, a hole from a, digging away from from uh, underneath uh, the shop of the pawnbroker to the cellar of the bank. and uh, so he he instructed mr jones the police officer to keep men uh, at the entrance of jabez wilson's shop also so clay's accomplice the man who had jumped back into the hole was caught by the police while trying to escape and holmes is thanked profusely by mr merryweather the bank director and mr jones of scotland yard so um Holmes was sure that the robbers would make the attempt on Saturday night because uh, the bank was closed for the weekend. So Saturday would also give them two days f- for their escape because Sunday was also a holiday. And finally, the uh, story ends with Watson's admiration. He says, "So long a chain, and yet every link rings true." So he uh, admires Holmes for uh, how the way he has reasoned out everything very beautifully and solved the strange mystery. So this is the interesting short story, the Red-Headed League by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Now the author himself has ranked the story as second among his twelve favorite Sherlock Holmes stories, 
and uh, from the story if you read the story you will understand that it uh, why it is remarkable for the elements that it is remarkable for uh, so the story is remarkable for the elements of surprise of thrill and suspense and hidden motives and it keeps keeps the reader engaged from the beginning till the end i hope you enjoyed this video lecture on the red headed league a short story by sir arthur conan doyle thank you so much for your patient listening